right, welcome back to uh, Shattering That Mess. Uh, we are, since we're getting uh, feedback here on uh, on Facebook about it's not funny to uh, poke fun at uh, at Texas, and uh, the town is called Waco, not Waco. Uh, in my defense, I was using Waco as an adjective. The town is Waco, but uh, it is Waco. Uh, so Waco is uh, is simply being used as a uh, as an adjective in this case. But Scott, you you brought up something that I think is a um, has, has far-reaching implications, and that is the French version of the banditos. So they'd be uh, les bandits. Uh, but the question I have is, would Le Bandit's logo fit on the side of a Vespa? <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, I'm, I'm picturing, a, I'm picturing a guy. For some reason, I'm, I'm picturing a guy with a beret on and a scarf. <laughs> and he's reaching into his Vespa. If you don't move your Vespa, I will throw my wine on you. <laughs> 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 I will shove your Vespa aside. No, I... To be fair, to be fair, Les this, 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 this story could be happening anywhere, and I would no. Be, this I, is I, a story that could only happen in Texas. <laughs> true, <laughs> I think it's different. True, but if it happened somewhere else, I'd still think this is like the most ridiculous story ever, and I am I'm amazed by it, and I am. It, it is the best action movie ever. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, during this, uh, during the last news, I heard a story that to me is even more um, unbelievable. That was uh, a senator of the United States said that he is running for president. This would be uh, Senator Lindsey Graham. That he's running for president of the United States because of what he sees on television. <laughs> I'm running for president because of what I see on television. <sighs> okay. <laughs> what is he watching on television? <laughs> Is that any more ridiculous than I'm running for president because God told me to? Uh, well, I will. Okay. You got me there. I mean, didn't, didn't Cruz say that? Isn't that what he said? I'm running for president, for president because God told me to. Oh. Yeah, I'm still getting over the American sniper or one of the ads. Uh, the, uh, the idiot says, uh, I'm prepared to answer to my creator for every time I pulled the trigger. <laughs> Good luck with that, pal. <laughs> yeah, I want you to see how well that works out with the uh, the boss. Hey, Kirk, what do you, hey, what do you think here? We've well, lost it, haven't we? Yep, yep, pretty much. It's a good show so far. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to get serious. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, now Texas is a weird place. Yeah, you know, Texas has... Uh, is a extraordinary religious place, both with uh, its affinity for uh, the, the Baptist. Uh, so you're, you've got to be baptized in uh, in Texas, and to be a Baptist. Uh, and second is that uh, you better love football because uh, high school football is uh, right next to the Sunday worship service in the Baptist church. Absolutely. People do not ask you in Texas, what religion are you? They say, what church do you go to? Go to. Exactly. I do that yeah. all through the South. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and it's only in Texas that they uh, build $30 million football shrines for high schools. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, $30 million football shrines to, to high school. You think there's a reason that, that people are coming out of Texas with their... Um, with the priorities screwed up? I guess. Huh. Oh, well, it was the birthplace of the Banditos and the Cossacks, so I guess it's got that going for them. Uh, I told to compliment you on two things. That, uh, oh, okay. I'm amazed. You said some uh, rather brilliant things the last two days. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. Okay. I mean, I... Like this morning, I'll give you the this morning was first, which almost got overlooked there. I was just sitting there listening, and you said uh, you were describing what Yosha said about um, uh, the people and the, uh, where he was praising the Ephesians. Mm-hmm. And he said, and you paraphrased it, of course, but you said, um, you know, he's basically delighted that they didn't convert to Christianity. Yeah, I've yeah. heard a hundred, hundreds, and hundreds of sermons on revelations in that section and that one has come up with you know he's really delighted they didn't become like the romans 
Yeah, like the uh, the Council of uh, Nicaea. Yeah. The Council of Nicaea is the birth of uh, of the religion of Christianity as we uh, as it's practiced today, and it was uh, wholly and completely Roman in its uh, nature. So it grew right out of the beast uh, that Yano was uh, talking about. But you know, one of the things that uh, is important here is, is to note that. Uh, um, I did not come to that conclusion um, quickly or easily. I was, uh, in my first versions of going through it, I was like everybody else. I, uh, I simply went to the fellow named as uh, Nicholas and, and tried to make sense of it, but I couldn't um, because of the fact that, that almost nothing is known about him, and Yosha just does not make comments about people that are not known. I mean, he's a big-picture guy. Yeah, you know, creator of the universe doesn't have time to uh, to tell you about the uh, the not like you and me. I, I I'm willing to talk about the banditos and the Cossacks. Yosh is not. Not that interesting. No. Way below his pay grade, the banditos and Cossacks, and uh, Nicholas would be way below his pay grade too. Um, but Christianity's not. He is uh, absolutely. Uh, focused on the problems of, uh, of Christianity because it's big picture. Billions of people have been uh, uh, led astray. And, and so it wasn't until um, I began to, to realize that really all of my analysis of the, of the, even of Yosha's statements in the Christian New Testament were um, prejudiced by my former uh, affinity for the Christian religion. And it took a lot, a lot of time and a lot of effort to jettison those things over over time and to have my eyes actually open once I had distanced myself from the lies and to say, oh, man. And you know where I came to realize it for the first time is that I, I wrote the, my four or five hundred pages on the beast that is Rome and how the beast that is Rome became the Roman Catholic Church. And it, it, the Council of Nicaea plays the pivotal role and all of that, from Constantine to Theodosius, and it's all right there. It's all in the Council of Nicaea, and it's named after the uh, Greek god of victory. So uh, it didn't come easily. It didn't come quickly, uh, but uh, it's there nonetheless. That's probably the first time I heard you kind of allude to it, but I thought today's uh, comment was really profound. I mean, just in a nutshell, that's exactly what he said. Yeah, exactly what he said. He says, I'm glad that you didn't become Christian. Uh, and now, Friday night, you, uh, I'll compliment you in those times. The, uh, okay. Friday night, uh, you said, uh, something I thought was amazing, and Terry and I both sat there and said, did you hear what he said? That's really great. Uh, when you were referring to explaining, now we all know the Malak are a, uh, a military-like construct. They, right. it's the command control, uh, situation. Right. And we know that because of the term you always use, to use the shell. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, to describe them. But there's no question on that, and we know that uh, Hasatan was uh, the chief, chief angel. You know, he was a big deal, mm -hmm. and he was one of them. So uh, right. that is the way he lives. That's the way he is. Right. And uh, there's no free will. You right. have to do exactly what you said, what he's right. told to do. Right. Therefore, it's very or immediate consequence. Right, or immediate mm -hmm. consequence, or some kind. Like of there is in the U.S. military, you can do, you can disobey an order in the U.S. military, yeah, but there's an immediate consequence. Yeah, shot in prison, whatever. Yeah, you don't have the right to do so. No. Now, then you concluded uh, that uh, when he when he said, I'm going to rise up above and set up my little deal, my king, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. the only only thing he can relate to, of course, is the Lord-slave relationship. Yeah, it is. So why would you think, so when you, when you see the Catholic Church, when you see Christianity, when you see people with Lord, mm -hmm. I mean, why doesn't it, trigger that, you know, that's a, a Lord is a master-slave mm -hmm. relationship. I mean, it is, yeah, well, exactly. What are we thinking? I mean, that's what are we thinking, yeah, or not thinking. Or not thinking. Yeah. I mean, it's quite profound. Yeah, and, I mean, but, you know, in both of those two um, uh, insights, both of them are right there in the text. I know, oh, I know. It's, it's, yeah, they're right there in the text. I mean, it, it's, 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 like, it's like everything that you've learned when you start studying the letters that comprise the words and you start thinking about them. It's all right there. I know. Well, like Scott said to me one time, he said, the only time, yeah, I said, well, how, how did it go? And he said, well, that was pretty good. At least you were, uh, they, they, that was quite brilliant a couple of times. And I said, what times? And he said, well, when you quoted Yahweh. <laughs> 
Yeah, because you know that um, I am extraordinarily reluctant to uh, to take credit for anything, and oh, no, I'm really you, uncomfortable. You, I'm really uncomfortable with praise, and I haven't been fighting you here because of the fact that it's you know, it should be apparent to our listeners. <laughs> I didn't do anything here, but finally shed the uh, the smoke screen of religion to the point that I actually could look at the text and I did enough research to see what he was talking about. And once you see it, it's you say, okay, that was obvious. Yeah. And so, but, but you know, I don't want to de-emphasize this though. But I say, okay, that was obvious in both cases. Command and control, and there's a reason that Yahweh chose Baal, Lord, to describe the adversary Satan. Mm -hmm. And that's the only natural conclusion of somebody that wants to be above God and that God refers to as adversarial and as a Lord. Uh, so, and when he uses the term Shabbat to define the Malach, all you got to do is put the, make the connections there and the conclusions are obvious. The same thing is true when uh, Yosha speaks of the, uh, of, uh, of Nicolaitan and uh, referencing uh, the, the people and thought process, the doctrine emanating out of uh, Nicaea. Uh, you know, all you've got to do is, is just shed the nonsense and say, okay, big picture. Yeah. What is he talking about? In context, he has been condemning uh, Christianity yeah. and Pauline doctrine. Okay, now let me ask you a question. And, mm -hmm. and, and relating to last week's show with uh, when Jason uh, mm -hmm. brought in the part of, uh, you know, where we were talking about uh, the 24th uh, uh, chapter of Matthew. Mm -hmm. And we had, you had quite a discussion about uh, Messiah, Messiah, you know, yes. and so forth, and there's yes. no definite article, and et cetera, right. et cetera. Is there any context, is there any context when you're talking about Yosha when this title would have been useful? Because Yosha, and my question is really, let me put it in this mm -hmm. context, Yosha mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. only a name, it's a mission mm -hmm. statement. It tells you right. what everything he's about. Yeah, it's also an identity statement. An identity statement. So and a why, statement. So why do you need to refer to him as Matthew? Right. Why not just refer to him as Yosha? Yeah, I mean, as Yosha, and then you can't mess it up. Then you know, as Yosha, you know from whom he came, yes. and you know why he's here. Right. So with Yosha, there is no way to mess it up. Yeah. There's a reason that Yosha is used as a name 220 times in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And why it's used in the context of the of the outgrowth and conclusion, the purpose of the covenant and the promised land. For those who may be wondering why we are continuing with uh, uh, with Matthew uh, 24 in today's program, that's where we left off uh, on uh, Friday. And the reason is because on the Friday evening program, we spent the entire uh, uh, Friday evening program, all uh, two hours of it focused on uh, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, and particularly in the context as it is derived from, uh, from 23. And it is a, uh, uh, for those who went to, uh, to listen to it, you can go to the blessyahwa.com site, and uh, Richard there on the blessyahwa.com site has uh, all of the programs from the Shabbat uh, show, itemized by topic, and you can uh, listen to it uh, uh, there. Uh, but it was interesting, I think, Kirk, to to set his comments into context and to realize that he was coming out of a wholesale um, judgment of, criticism of, expose on, condemnation of, the religious and political establishment, the scribes and the Pharisees, um, the scribes being liberal uh, political uh, leaders um, and the Pharisees being uh, orthodox uh, and conservative religious leaders. So he was taking the Republicans and Democrats, if you will, of, uh, of Israel circa uh, 33 CE and judging both. I mean, this idea that judge not must you be judged. Um, he was he was as judgmental as you can be, and pejorative. I mean, he he used mean terms. I mean, he called them uh, hypocrites. 
he uh, called them frauds. He, can, he said that uh, they were uh, uh, demonically possessed. Uh, they were the uh, children of, uh, of serpents, demons. So it is interesting to, for him to show his overt hostility towards political and religious leaders. Uh, it's, of course, it undermines, undermines uh, Romans uh, 13, where Paul said that every government was established by God and it's good for you. And here is uh, Deosha completely condemning uh, every aspect of the government of Israel. Um, and then from there, it, uh, it focuses on the differentiation between the institutions of man and the family of God where he says, no, I'm going to leave you to your own institutions. And the starkness of that, if you think about it, he's telling political types and religious types, I'm just going to walk away from you. I'm going to leave you lifeless. I'm going to leave you to yourselves. I'm going to have nothing to do with you. In those circumstances, it's pretty darn hard to justify this idea that all religions are a path to God and that political institutions are, uh, are good. Or that any. Any. You know, the only country that he cares about is Israel. And if he's condemning Israel's politicians and government. Mm-hmm. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. So it's, uh, and it flows out of that, and it flows out of his comparison of his house, of, of the temple, of his home on earth, uh, compared with human institutions. And uh, then associates him with the other set-apart manifestation of Yahweh, the set-apart spirit, and the uh, uh, maternal nature of a uh, of a mother bird trying to protect uh, her children, and, and yet uh, him saying, uh, but you were unwilling. And then it was from that contrast, the covenant and the, and the Torah's uh, literal um, uh, representation here on earth, uh, the covenant's representation here on earth, Yahweh's place here on earth. From that comparison between those things and the institutions of man, he says, you know, that, that the temple representing Yahweh's home and the, the special place where we uh, get access to the mercy seat and to the Torah and to the covenant, that that's going to be torn down. And you know, why isn't that you don't see that being torn down? And while he was physically talking about the Roman destruction of the temple in 70 CE, of course, Roman, understand Roman and Roman Catholic, but he was talking about the dismantling of the covenant, of the Torah, of the place that Jerusalem plays and the temple plays, and Yahweh's relationship with his people, that being dismantled, and it was all of that that he wanted us to understand. And that is what Pauline Christianity sought to accomplish, did accomplish. And what does y'all love more than anything else in the universe? Oh, well, his, his word, but his family. Yeah, his word and his family, which is his covenant. So, so the context of that is, you know, when you say covenant, most of us may not think of it as strong as that to me it's like this is it this is everything that's important to him that's right there exactly yeah. right and the stones that are being overturned to the word the stones that that build this pathway to to god his words that comprise the very walls of his home will return in a moment you uh were brought up uh, what is something that, that I have um, struggled with for some time. And that is that uh, having been a Christian, having been one of the youngest ordained ruling elders uh, really in the history of the uh, Presbyterian Church, uh, I, uh, I use the term Christ to define myself, Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, I use Christ as a last name, as in Jesus Christ. So when I began to write Yada Yon and Intro to God, I really had a very difficult time trying to understand the basis of that. Now, we know that Christos, uh, the Greek word uh, that um, became uh, uh, Christ, means to apply drugs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, immediately then you go to the Hebrew, and the Hebrew title, depending on how it's written, is either Masayak or 
Masaya. It's used 22 times in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms as a name. Masaya. Masaya is a, is a compound of uh, Masa, which is the Hebrew word for work, and, uh, and Yahweh. So it would be the work of Yahweh. And used 22 times as a name. But then I began to study Masayak, and you know what I found? It was never once written as a name. It was never even once written as a title. There is no title, Ha Masayak, the Messiah. Not one. And the two times that it that it's written prophetically, where you say, all right, we can use it because it exists in prophecy. There's only two times. And both times it's used as a adjective. Adjectives modify nouns. And as an adjective, it means set apart and prepared, suited for service. So if, if Shimon Kefesh, who's been corrupted to Peter, uh, and uh, if Shimon Kefesh, uh, which means listen to him, said uh, that you are the son of a living God and that you are Masayak, he would have said that you are set apart from the living God and prepared and suited to serve. And, of course, where was, where was Yahusha headed at that very moment? Passover. You betcha. To be the Passover lamb. And so if he used the term as it's used in Daniel, he was describing the fact that he was set apart and suited to serve. He was not naming him. Now, that makes perfect sense to, uh, you know, uh, get away from the rock stuff. This is perfect sense of uh, why he was so acceptable of what he said. Why yes. He, yes. Yeah. And he said, you know, based upon this revelation that he was going to build uh, his, uh, upon this rock, and sewer is the term in Hebrew. And so, again, we have rocks, rocks being overturned, rocks which are words, now, these are words spoken, so he's now defining what a rock is uh-huh. that he's going to use to build. What did Shimon say? He, but just as a statement by Shimon, so words. Accurately spoken words are the rock that he builds his, uh, his um, guidance to us on, his path to us on, to, to him on. So you've got upon this rock, this sewer, I will build mana, D-N-H. I will build. And then he said his mikra, uh, ecclesia, which is changed to church in Christian Bibles, has nothing to do with church. Church is a transliteration of the name of the sun goddess of the Teutonic religion, where Helios, the sun, is God. And it, uh, it is uh, in, from where we get circle and, uh, and uh, circus, um, which is the circles with the shape of the, uh, of the sun, of the halos that are in religious context. She was a pagan deity. So that's church. Mm-hmm. That was her name, church. Uh, he said, uh, he said Mikra. And we know that because the, the only the Hebrew word that Yosha would have spoken that can be translated ecclesia, called out, is uh, Mikra, and the plural Mikra. Uh, and Mikra means to call out. Right. To be called out. And just like ecclesia, it means to invite, to summon. And so it's a ecclesia, the translation of Mikra, and he says, so upon this I'm going to build, B N H, my Mikra, which are the seven invitations to meet. So if he was set apart and prepared to f- fulfill, uh, and to set apart and, and suited to, uh, to do what, what, Yahweh needed it done, he just described what he was going to do. He's going to fulfill the Mikra. He fulfilled the first four, didn't he? Yes. So it's all laid out there, right there for you, when you understand what it means, set apart and suited to serve. Right. But why don't you just um, help our listeners understand when he, when he said build. Uh-huh. DNA? Yeah, DNA. Yeah. Well, you what was he building? Well, he's building this family home of people who are upright and want to have this inheritance. Right. Or, or then children of right. inheritance, if you like. Correct. And, yeah. And the letters spell it out. So, uh, children built, uh, born into the family who uh, enter the, uh, the home, who are upright in that home, paying attention. Right. Uh, 
exactly. It's Biath. Uh, Biath is is home and family. Nun is drawn as a, uh, uh, and then Biath is the floor plan of a home, uh, with one way in, and Bien is a sperm. I mean, a nun is a sperm. It's a child born with an inheritance. Children born into the family, children in the home of God. And not just any child, it's the children of the covenant because the He, the ending letter, is the only letter that's repeated twice in the Allah's name. It's the picture of the person standing up, reaching up, paying attention to God. Right. Those are the only people in your home. If you're not standing up, you're not in his home. If you're bowed down, you're excluded from his home. And nothing you said is a stretch. No. Absolutely nothing. I mean, you can no. say, well, you're twisting this. No, you're not. No, no, no. What I'm doing here is I'm, is I'm clearing away that which misled and confused me for so long. Well, I'm clearing away all of the, the smoke and mirrors of Christianity. And I'm getting... Right to what did he say? You know, I said this a, bu a bunch of times on this program, and and I'm I'm absolutely convinced of it. If you want to understand what Yosha said, you have to realize he spoke in Hebrew. He was affirming and citing the Torah in Hebrew, and so when you read the Greek, you've got to translate what he said back into the the only Hebrew word that could have been used that was later translated into Greek. And so you've got to think in Hebrew. I just bought two books to do that. I mean, because I have a hard time with that because I have to use Strong's to go back and figure out what the word was that was translated into Greek to go back to figure out what it was in Hebrew to go back right. and change the letters. So I found the uh, uh, Terry Boltz on a couple of books on uh, Hebrew Greek dictionary and that's so, so I can make that transition easy because I was struggling. I, I, I just about given up on the Greek. I was hoping that we didn't have to go there. Yeah, well, I, I really have too. I've given up on the Greek for lots of reasons. But, you know. but this is kind of important. What what you yes. said. So yeah, so I would I, agree. So I'm just trying to figure out how to do it quicker without, uh, uh, so I can actually sit here and keep up with you guys, like you and Jason. So uh, well, you know, I can't do it. I can't do it quickly. Well, I can't I mean, it, it may sound like oh, we've come up with these insights, and it says, okay, you know, you're you're rattling these off, but they didn't happen quickly. It happened as a result of of 15 years of studying Hebrew, sure. of gradually, slowly, word by word, stem by stem, mood by mood, conjunction by conjunction, illustration by illustrations, connection by connection, gradually coming to know who Yahweh is, to understand what he's offering us, to to see how all of that's conveyed through these letters and words, and then coming to know what the words mean, it was uh, more than a decade of doing that. And then when you do it, then you're, you know, when you're observant, you're able to see, particularly when you consistently try to separate yourself from the fog of religion. But it, it's hard when you refer to a... a <clears throat> the stuff is written out in the uh, witness writings to not know, uh, you know, where you have to go back to, the, you have to go from English to the Greek and the Greek back to the... Oh, I know. Yeah, it's hard. Time. It's hard. Oh. Yeah, and, uh, and, and the problem there is that if you make too big a deal of the Greek, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are, are wanting to do that, you know, to really analyze the Greek, you can't do that. And that was my tendency, because I really like to get down to the details of what the words mean. But if you do that with the Greek, what you're doing is emphasizing a language that was not used. No. I don't care what men chose to use as a translation of what they think Yahweh said. Mm -hmm. I care what he said. No. He spoke Hebrew. Right. He didn't speak Greek. Right. And so you've got to cleanse your palate of the, of the Greek thought process because... Greek is a philosophical language. It's a, uh, a language um, that is, was designed specifically to convey the philosophy of the Greeks, which was to essentially say that there were um, two realities, uh, a perfect reality that was of the spirit and was part of their pagan religion, and a inferior version of it, a shadow of it that was of the flesh. And Pauline doctrine is written this way. Right. And so it's, it's just a corrupt tool. And so if you really analyze the Greek, I think you're going in the wrong direction. You can't, can't embrace it. 
No, and that's right. what you need to do. Right. So what you need to do is to say, all right, um, here's the Greek translation. What is the word that it was used to translate in Hebrew, and what does the Hebrew word mean? And with Yosha, it's not all that difficult to do because Yosha quoted the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms in Hebrew, which has been now translated into Greek hundreds upon hundreds of times. So every time that he translates, and he, he's not translating, every time that he presents the, the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms in Hebrew, and it's translated into Greek, what do you have to do? You have to go back to the Hebrew. Right. And so since we have the Hebrew, it's very easy to know what each of the words that he that he is now translated to have uh, been translated in in Greek, you can take them back to Hebrew just by looking at the passages he quoted. So if you want to to hone your skill to understand what he said in Hebrew, that's what I would start. I would what I would do is I'd make uh, if I were you, and I think this is a worthwhile thing to do. I'd make a lexicon of Greek terms for their Hebrew equivalent by uh, by beginning by referencing those things that he um, he it, it, the times that he's actually quoting. Uh, the Hebrew Torah prophets and so on, because there you know for certain what he actually said, and you know how the Greek was used to translate what he said. So you can reverse engineer it right. based upon that. It just takes a little while. Oh, well, it's going to take a little while, but the rewards for uh, for doing that will be extraordinary. Um, yeah. Because his comments on the Torah prophets and Psalms and the covenant are brilliant. We'll be back. Well, understanding that Yosha is set apart and prepared to serve in the building of his um, family through the invitations to be called out and meet the seven Mikre and fulfilling immediately thereafter the first four. All of that makes great sense. That was the the stone upon which uh, you know, Yosha was going to build his family through the fulfillment of the Moed Mikre. Uh, in fact, the first four Mikre are, provide the first all five benefits of the covenant. So there's a direct tie there. But Kirk, mm-hmm. it's impossible, really, that, it, uh, that Yosha meaningfully fulfilled a prophecy about becoming the Messiah when there's no reference to the Messiah anywhere in the prophets. No. That's what, that's what I mean. The revelation to me, the, the gestalt or whatever to me, mm-hmm. was that uh, Messiah is just ill-placed. Once you, once mm-hmm. They had to destroy, you know, they don't come in Jesus' name. Right. Uh, they come in Christ's name. They, they're always used, even in, this, in the English passages, it's always they will, they will come right. you know, as Christ uh, because you can, you can misinterpret Messiah with a translation of Christ. You can change it all, but you can't change the ocean. No. The ocean is yeah. it's just just right in your face. Yeah, the uh, the Nicodian Nicaea victory uh-huh. over yeah. uh, over Hebrew and the Torah uh-huh. is uh, is Christ Christo, yeah. Christos, uh, and the fact that he he now has a name, he has an identity. He's the yeah. Christos. Yes. He's the one who drugs, the one who intoxicates. Well, that's what I got. Yeah. That's what I got, though. Is, and that yeah. made perfect sense to me. He don't want to run around calling himself Jesus. Yeah, the, yeah and that's why he said in the... one, he wants to be a priest, though. Yeah, that's why he said in uh, Montana 24 mm-hmm. that uh, many will will say that I am the Christos. Right, right. <laughs> that's, that's, I am the, uh, the Christ. And, you know, that many say that. He's yeah. not. He's not. So he was the Messiah, right? Yeah. To the work. Yeah, he's not. His work. That's the thing. He's his the whole church has to yeah. his work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If you don't know his name, you don't know who he is. Yeah. If you don't know his name, you don't know who Yahweh is. If you don't know his name, you most certainly aren't engaged in a relationship with him. If you don't know his name, you aren't saved. And, you know, I know a lot of people that have a connection that, okay, you think that all of this is based on a name, but God has many names, and he knows who I'm talking about. No, he has one name. He has one name, and it, it tells his story. 
You're right. And if you don't know his name, you do not know him. Yeah, because you don't know his story. All right. His, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really clear about his name. He has only one name that he wants to be known by. Yeah. Not two names. Not Yahweh and Yosha. No. And so that means that Yosha is a, a designation of Yahweh's renown. It's a designation of Yahweh's purpose. It's a designation of Yosha's um, uh, mission. Uh, it has nothing to do with the name. It's, um, it's a mission statement. It's an identity designation. Let me go one step further. You started this out with him talking about destroying the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, no stone unturned. Inside the temple, of course, is the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Uh, when you look up the word Ark of the Covenant, Ark, uh -huh. the word, I, I know you know this, but it's uh, Aleph, Roche, Wad, Nun, mm -hmm. uh, is the Ark of the Covenant. And it's uh, the authority with the power and the ability to do the work together, the observant people, to enlarge the family with inheritance. Yeah. And the word is A-R-W-N, Heron, enlighten right. free will. Enlighten free will. And that's what the ark is. I mean, right. that's why we know it's, it's still there. He's not going to let somebody destroy yeah. that message. It's yeah. still there. Yeah, and it's uh, it's based upon the Hebrew word for light and the Hebrew word for oath and the Hebrew word for e uh, uh, infinity, mm -hmm. for all time. It's the enlightened testimony of Yahweh, the testimony that enlightens that is not only eternal, but is the very vow or promise of the creator of the universe. I mean, everywhere you turn, every right. reference he gives so, you. So you tell me, uh, Kirk, what, what's more insightful? Uh, Aaron, which is uh, enlightened free will, uh -huh. the eternal promise of Yahweh to empower us, to, to transform us into light based upon us making an enlightened choice uh -huh. for Ark. Uh, Ark means nothing. <laughs> means nothing. Means nothing. Even the root. Even the, Even the root. Yeah, it means absolutely nothing. And the other is extraordinarily profound. So if you're just trying to communicate in English, are you going to know what God said, or do you have to think in Hebrew? Do you have to peel back the layers in Hebrew? Is there a reason, my friend, that in his longest public statement, Yosha began it by saying not a single yod or a tittle, not a single letter or stroke of a letter, the Torah will ever be annulled.